Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Charles Rice. I'm the host for today's webinar, and our subject is uh, sound quality jury testing. Your presenter for today is Aneska. Uh, there, there she is right there on the screen. Aneska, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Agnieszka Otarzewska. I'm a product manager for some of our acoustic products, including the jury testing. I'm currently residing in Belgium, so it's um, yeah about 7 p.m. here. I do apologize for my background. Unfortunately, WebEx does not have this great blur uh, filter option. So you do have to experience my unpacked boxes after moving the house, but I hope that's not gonna stop us from enjoying this webinar. Not at all. Thanks, Aneska. And as always, if you have any questions uh, during the webinar, please type them in the questions panel in your webinar control area. We'll be happy to reply there. Sometimes we'll be able to discuss the question live during the webinar. And certainly, if need be, we will follow up with you later via email. After this webinar is over, you're going to get a follow up email, which will contain an ESCA's presentation, as well as a link to the recording of this webinar and links to other great webinars that are happening this month. But with that, Aneska, we're going to give our attention to you. Thank you, Charles. OK, we have a lot of material, so I'm going to get right to it and start with the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to start by introducing jury testing. I know that this may be a familiar topic to many of you, but just to have a kind of a common ground for a startup, just a quick information what jury testing is. Then we'll talk about how to prepare test samples for a listing test. Um, I'll try to tell you how many jurors do you normally need for a jury testing, um, how to select the right test type for the type of questions that you want to ask, um, how to conduct the listing tests, the do's and the don'ts, um, how to analyze all the data, and finally, why would you even do it? So let's start with the introduction to jury testing. So um, here's a kind of a, a situational scheme. We have a person on the left-hand side wearing a tie, and that person is the test moderator. This would be us, the people that are starting a jury test, conducting a jury or a listening test that wants to learn more about the particular sound or a, a group of sounds. On the right hand side, we have the jurors. That's the people that are invited in to answer the questions. And the goal to have a, is to have a, a good statistical representation of your potential future customers. Let's agree to that. So how does it work? In a very simple way. Um, the moderator is going to play sound A, then he or she is going to play sound B, and then a question will be asked. And this can be absolutely anything. Um, uh, which sound do you prefer? Uh, which one of them is, sounds more sporty or more robust or more luxurious? Uh, you can really uh, go wild with these questions. The goal is to really um, serve your purpose. What do you want to find out from your listeners? That's the question that you're going to ask. And people are going to answer. And the important thing is that um, none of these answers is wrong because these are subjective tests, which means people tell you about their subjective preference. It's up to you to take kind of an average out of that and figure out, OK, it seems that majority of my jurors, in this case, 66 percent, prefer sound A. So this is maybe the design variant or a competitive product that is the reference for this particular jury group. So that is a little bit in a schematic type of way. If we tried to look at uh, a real test, I think I have a slightly older recording for you. Um, that shows how this test looks like in reality. There's no sound in here. So people would come in, they sit in front of their PCs and they wear headphones. Headphones are pretty relevant for a good sound quality, a sound representation. And you have the moderator sitting there with another PC and people are first discussing before a test happens. And then a test will conclude with a super simple interface. The less complicated it is, the better and they will answer the questions. So everyone listens to the same sound and then they see a question, which one of them do you prefer? A, B, in this case, or equal. And you can click on the button, then wait for others to reply and continue with the next test. So this is how this type of analysis looks like in, in real life, so to speak. So this is in a very short uh, introduction, what or how a jury test looks like. Yeah? Now, let's talk about um, what type of sounds 
should you use um, for a jury test? And there's a few rules um, or guidelines that I would suggest. First of all, the environment. Uh, the environment in which you measure for a jury test should be as similar as possible to where your product will um, in the end operate. So for an example, if you are doing jury tests on automotive sounds, then using a semi anechoic room for the measurement would be a very good idea because you have the reflections from the ground, but you have some attenuation from the surrounding walls, which means the sound samples are not going to be um, um, messed up by any additional noise. You have good um, representative environment. In a similar case, if you're doing a jury test on white good equipment, let's say a kettle like here in the picture, you would like to position it in a quiet environment, which still has quite a lot of reflections because normally a kettle operates in a kitchen. A kitchen has quite a lot of uh, yeah, uh, stiff uh, flat surfaces, which do result in a lot of reflections. So you try to create an acoustic environment similar to where the product normally resides. Secondly, it's condition. Um, try to make them typical for the application and keep them as realistic as possible. So for an example, um, if you are doing a analysis on uh, washing machines, uh, make sure that there is some laundry in the washing machines, such that when the machines operate, they operate under a certain condition, which is typical to their operation. Um, if it's a kettle, there should be water inside. The water should start always at the same temperature. Um, if it's an electric vehicle, it should be charged before you start, and so on, so on, so on. And finally, on the benchmarking part, um, and what I like to call it, um, yeah, comparing apples to oranges, make sure that you are fair in your comparison. Meaning that if you um, are doing a benchmark comparison, make sure that you are giving all the products the same, let's say, starting point uh, <laughs> or, uh, of the measurement. So if you're doing laundry, let it for a washing machine benchmark of the sound, make sure that they all have a similar type of load inside, starting from the similar condition. If it's electric cars, that they are all charged to the same battery level. If it's a kettle, that the water levels in the kettles is the same and the starting temperature is the same as well. So this is simply about being fair towards the samples that you're using. Now, in terms of the um, some additional um, information about the samples, we have to focus on two aspects. Uh, how long the sound sample should be and how loud the sound sample should be. On the lengths, um, here are some guidelines. There are no rules. There is no good or bad way to do it. These are just suggest so oh, hard word suggestions that I'm giving to you based on our experience of performing jury tests um, for research purposes. So I would say, for a stationary sound, so a sound that doesn't change in function of time, a length of approximately three to five seconds is typically sufficient for people to judge. If the sound is transient, if it changes in function of time, and a super clear example is a run-up of a vehicle, then it can definitely be longer, and it can be as long as you need it to be to have a good representation of the, um, the sound that you're trying to measure. But there, there is a constraint and we're gonna, <laughs> the number is in red for a reason. Your overall jury test, so the complete listening test, should not be longer than approximately 45 minutes. The reason for that being, um, people get tired and they get frustrated. And after 45 minutes of listening to the same type of sounds, they're not gonna give you high quality answers. Huh? They're gonna get frustrated, they're gonna get annoyed, they're gonna start answering randomly. You're not gonna get a good quality result. So keeping it nice and short is actually the way to get a good quality jury test and good quality jury test answers mainly. Um, in terms of loudness of the sounds, loudness being a psychoacoustic metric that judges the human perception to how loud a sound is, pretty cool metric. Uh, it's a linear metric, which means if something is two times, it, ha it has two times more zones, zones is the unit of loudness, it is to us appears two times louder. Uh, you can do two things. Uh, you can keep the sounds as they are, meaning you measure um, three cars 
two of them have a certain loudness level, the third has a much higher loudness, but you keep the original loudness. This is something that you would do when you perform benchmarking. So when you're comparing products, you would do it because you want a real um, type of answer from people rather than them having an assumption of the sound based on uh, some kind of an editing that you did to decrease the loudness. So you would keep the original loudness levels. Uh, but loudness is also the absolute most um, impactful metric on how we judge sounds. Uh, it can be an extremely rough sound. It can have a lot of tones. If the loudness is significantly lower, people will have a natural preference towards that sound. So if you are trying to really focus on nitty gritty details of a sound, on modulation, on certain aspects of tonality, on impulsiveness, then trying to have a similar equalized loudness of your sound samples may be required because there is very little people in and out of the industry that can look or listen beyond loudness. And you can have experts in the company that know that they have to ignore the loudness and focus on modulation, for an example. But if you are doing a, a broad audience type of screening, uh, people will judge based on loudness, they're gonna ignore everything else. So sometimes the loudness equalization is required and then it's best to do it. But for benchmarking of real products, I would avoid it because then are you really comparing the same products if their final loudness is different? Righty, and I have my first video to show you. That video, I'll start it in a second, is actually a example of two types of sounds which are already prepared for a jury test. The group number one is washing machines. Group number two is a run-up of a vehicle. I think they're electric vehicles. Uh, we'll see that in a second. So I have to show you my first video. Okay, so it's gonna start with the washing machines. You can see on the left hand side, there is the spectrum of the currently replayed sound. Below are the sound samples. And on the right hand side is the time varying loudness for these samples. And you can see it's very different between the different samples. I will play the example and then switch to the um, power run-ups in a second. Okay, so that was the example of the washing machines, very different sounds, very different loudness levels. But these sounds were ready for a jury test. They had the similar length. I think they are like 3.8 seconds, which is really kind of in the middle of that time frame that we discussed. And it's a benchmark of real existing products that are available on the market. So very much okay to keep them at different loudness levels. Uh, I will now play the second part that is the electrical or not, electrical not. I think electrical car run-ups. So I'll let you, oh, I know this is a Tesla Model S sound, pure, without any modifications. And additionally, we added some sound design options on top of it to check how it would sound. And that's a jury test that we run. And I will show you the results of this jury test at the end of the presentation. So have a listen to the second part. Okay, so you can see and hear that these sound samples are slightly longer. I think the, the longest one is like 8.5 seconds. And that's okay, because we wanted the complete run up, we tried to get from a similar type of speed, to similar type of speed, I think like 20 to 50 kph. And that's okay. They are longer, but that's needed. We're not because we wanted this type of evaluation. Uh, at that case, you would try to make sure that the sounds that the whole jury test again is a bit shorter, such that you still uh, stay underneath the 45 minutes. Okay, back to screen two. So that was just an example. Now I would like to show you the actual software 
uh, demonstration on how we would start with preparing the sounds. So we have here um, test lab opened. Uh, if you don't know where to find jury testing on your systems, you can go to your folder test lab acoustics. And here is the jury testing application. You're going to start it and it's going to open with normal test lab classic screen starting with the navigator. So I already have um, four sounds in here. And these sounds are actually um, electric bicycles. Uh, they're already in my input basket. I'm just going to jump to time data selection, replace them from input basket, show all of them, and let you see them yourself. I think I will have a video um, which will allow you to listen to these samples in a second. So make sure it's going to be there. So these are my four input signals. These are stereo signals, which means they were recorded with a binaural device, um, which would be the standard thing to do. Um, many, many, many um, drug tests are performed on binaural measurements, and be it from a binaural headset, from a binaural head, or simply from two microphones being placed on the left and ear right position. Um, it's simply because the representation of a binaural measurement is better for a um, a good um, yeah sound quality and a good uh, replay um, experience for the jurors. It will sound more natural if it was measured as a binaural uh, measurement. And of course, having a a natural representation, having the feeling oh it sounds as if I was there, is very important for a good jury test. So we have the four sounds. Uh, they are in the time data selection. And if you know Tesla Classic, you know that from this step, you could just normally load um, time data processing and start the processing. In a very similar way, I just switch to my jury testing major and click on load sounds. And my sounds are here, bike A, bike B, bike C, and bike D. I'm going to give it the name, uh, bicycles. Um, I could play these sounds right now, but since we're on WebEx, you're not going to be able to hear it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to my video and let you hear the sounds yourself. Okay, I think the video is ready. So I will let you hear the e-bike sounds that we're going to use for the jury test. So four very quick uh, measurements, that's four, um, um, blah, blah, blah. how did you do it? It was a kind of a, a bicycle just driving on a fairly smooth surface um, and in a similar conditions at fairly similar speeds. We tried our best. Um, let me just have a look at the, okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to ju jump back to the presentation for a second. Um, and then we will continue with setting up the jury test. So we go back to the screen. Let's see if my presentation is running. No. Okay. So we have loaded the sounds into the uh, jury test. We're going to set it up in a second. But a very popular question that I get uh, very often in trainings like this is uh, how many jurors do I need actually? Um, and uh, as many as possible is absolutely not the, the correct answer. Uh, of course, if you have the luxury of inviting 150 people for your jury test, um, I am very jealous. <laughs> but typically, we cannot do that. Typically, it's, 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 it's logistically difficult to have 150 people to come to a jury test. Very often, 150 people is not going to give you a more quality results or higher quality results than having 30 people. So here are some guidelines. Um, I would say phase one, when you are designing the test for the first time, my suggestion is to contact a small group of experts in your company, like people that are um, familiar with judging sounds 
and that's three or more people and just have them take the, the test and collect the feedback because very often things that are um that seem obvious to us and natural to us are not necessarily going to con convey very well towards our audience uh, very often if you are working in a kind of a specialized uh, domain if you're really focusing on very nitty-gritty details you will not have to go beyond this step um, because it's enough if you get to have the feedback of your um, MVH or some quality experts. But um, on the other hand, when doing research, when designing new um, psychoacoustic metrics, when trying to get answers to what your customers think about a certain product or how do they associate a certain um, adjective, like sport if let's say marketing people tell you uh, make a, a car that sounds sporty or make a hair dryer that sounds luxurious um very often what you're going to have to start with is understanding what do people uh link to the word luxurious and what do they think that luxurious sounds like so then what you may have to do is invite a wider selection of jurors they should however try to represent the audience that you are targeting with your product. A very sad but honest answer is invite people that can afford a Lamborghini if you're doing a jury test on a Lamborghini, which is not always easy, but the, the better match you have with um, your target audience, probably the higher type of quality type of answers you're going to get. There is not really a single number of jurors that is enough. Uh, typical tests are run with 20 to 30 people that would be invited for a test. Um, for easier types of questions or sounds, uh, less is okay, uh, but more can help if you want to have a diverse representation in your sound samples. What is important to note that approximately, and again, that can differ from a setup to setup, 10 to 20% of your jurors will be eliminated by you because of poor quality of answers. Uh, meaning that their answers will be random, uh, their answers might be, you know, completely uncorrelated or simply an incomplete disagreement with everyone else in the room. So you have to account for those people uh, that you will have to yourself eliminate from the study. Luckily, this is not difficult to do. I will show you how to do it later. But these are my guidelines. This being said, this is not a perfect numbers or a perfect formula. It can be that you may need more, it can be that you may need less. Having a look at your results and analyzing may tell you that it would be a good idea to extend your base. But if you run your 150 juror test, what I can tell you is very possibly after analyzing 50 jurors, you will notice that adding another 50 doesn't really change your results that much, especially if your jury test was designed correctly. Already, uh, let's talk about selecting the right test type for you and i will do it based on um what type of jury tests because there's more than one do we have in the sim center test lab jury testing let me check the clock the clock is good so we start with the simplest of tests it's called the paired comparison aka the ab comparison in this type of test you would take two sounds and you compare them next to each other, which means that in a single sheet like this, two sounds are played, sound A, then sound B. You have an indication with the color, and then the juror has to give his or her answer uh, to the question that he or she sees on the screen. So in here, it's which car would you prefer to drive, A or B? The answer in this case, the juror answered B. Um, the pros of this test, super easy to answer, because we have two sounds that we can compare next to each other, it makes it easier to give an answer. And it does result in a kind of a ranking of sounds, of sound that has been the most selected to the least selected. Um, the con is that it provides an answer only to a single question. And very often we're going to run this test with a, what we call an A-B replication mode, meaning that, um, let's say, in the beginning of the test you hear sound one and sound two, 10 minutes later, you're going to hear the same pair, but in the reverse order, sound two versus sound one. And we do this for a consistency check. We're going to check if the jurors are consistent in their answers. 
that allows us to eliminate people that are answering randomly. This also means that your test is two times longer, which is, you know, remember the 45 minutes we have to fit in that area. Um, what you may have seen in the marketing video in the beginning is that there we had a button in the middle. Um, that button had the option equal. So we gave the people the option to say they're actually equally good. I prefer both of them the same. There is a, a very big danger <laughs> to giving people that option because we as human beings are pretty lazy on average. And it's the easiest thing just to say, nah, I'm not sure, yeah, it's equal. And, and what you end up with is a test where 80% of the people just keep on hitting the equal button, um, which is not great. I would advise against it, which is why we very often suggest to use this option to not have the equal button, and that is called the forced answer type of test. And you can select that yourself. Um, test number two, uh, very popular, it's called the semantic differential. Semantic differential allows you to break down the sound into features. What you do is you show opposing adjectives on the screen here. I know it's a bit blurry, but it says not sporty, very sporty, loud, quiet, bad quality, high quality. And people have a chance to select for the particular single sound that they're hearing, where do they sound reside? So in the case of the screen, the sound is very sporty, but quite loud, but sounds like high quality. Probably the Lamborghini. Um, and each sound that is part of your jury test, the jurors will be represented with a screen like this, and they will have the chance to give their scores on these opposing adjectives. Um, there's a big pro to this approach. Um, you do understand much more about your sound samples. You can really break them into different features. You learn more from a single test. But this test is more difficult to answer because people have to have a, a fairly common understanding of, of what sporty sound means. And this can be pretty different from person to person. Uh, and the adjectives, they can be tricky to answer. Um, you know, sometimes this is a language barrier. Sometimes this is, as I mentioned before, simply a, a common agreement on what a sporty car sounds like. And it's, it can be like for people coming from different, um, different backgrounds, uh, for an example, from different continents, the, the average expectation from a car and the way it sounds is different because, you know, cars released on different markets are designed and tuned for different regions. Um, and it can be simply, you may observe that in your results, that there is a certain clustering of answers depending on where people are coming from. Uh, option number three, very similar to the previous one, it's called category judgment. In category judgment, you will ask a single or multiple questions, but you will only be presented with the buttons that allow you to answer without any opposing adjectives. It's very similar to semantic differential because you can again sound, does it sound sporty? And the answers are not at all slightly, moderately, very extremely. You can also design these questions that appear on the buttons yourself. Uh, similar, similar pros, similar cons. It's simply another way to to ask a similar question as the one before. Um, then there is the Sheffe method. The Sheffe method is a fairly, uh, I would say it's a bit less popular, but it's super powerful. Um, it's something that we implemented because of very uh, uh, urgent <laughs> requests from our Japanese colleagues, apparently in Japan, and uh, this type of testing is extremely popular. So how it works, it's actually a combination of the first and the, and the third test. Um, the sounds that you use for a jury test are randomly paired together. And on each screen, you will be presented with two sounds, sound A, sound B, you don't know what they really are. And then you get to answer, for an example, does it, which of these sound more expensive, sound A or sound B? And people can use the buttons to indicate that in this particular pair, sound A, sound one with sound two, sound one seems to be more expensive, but sound B seem to have higher quality and they sound equally pleasant. Um, which is kind of nice because again, you stay with, um, you know, having two sounds next to each other, which is easier on jurors, 
but you do learn more about these features, which is the benefit of the category judgment, for an example. Um, there is um, some negatives to this test. Uh, because of the type of the test that it is, well, because of the specification of this method, um, the AB replication, meaning that you hear sound one, sound two, and then later on you hear sound two, sound one, it's a requirement that you do this. You cannot run this test without this option enabled, which means that um, you know your final test ends up being two times longer than initially uh, it would have to be, which also means that you probably will have to narrow down your list of samples. Uh, and again, we have the adjectives. They can, again, be a little bit tricky to answer because what sounds expensive to me doesn't have to sound expensive to Charles and vice versa. Uh, the last one, a, um, the, 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 the people pleaser, <laughs> the, 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 the jury favorite, ranking. Ranking is super simple. Uh, as a designer, you just pick two adjectives, quiet and loud, for an example, and the sounds are presented as a flat list between them. You have the buttons to start the replay, and you can drag and drop them to rearrange them. And you rearrange them, in this case, from the most quiet to the most loud. Um, super simple to do. I mean, even a person that you ask to come in from the street most likely would be able to do this. But what is important to remember with ranking is that since the samples are played so close to each other, like literally, you know, you can even stop and start the replay of the second one and within a second, um, people tend to be more harsh in their judgment because they really listen back to back and they really start to focus on the minute details of this, um, of, of the difference between them, which is not the case for, let's say, normal day-to-day -day listening. You, you, you don't really pay that much attention to the, the tiniest of differences between sounds. So it's possible that the, 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 the results will be slightly exaggerated. But still, this is the easiest test for people. This is the easiest test for jurors. It's also really quick because, you know, you can design 20 of these questions Okay, that takes some time, but still, probably it's going to take you like one, two minutes per uh, question to rearrange the sounds. So it's pretty cool, and you can really get a lot of answers in a very short time. So you can see that it's a kind of a, a trade off. Uh, there's no one ideal test. They give you different um, benefits, but they have kind of a different cost, I would say. Um, this is when I was supposed to play the e bike sound, nevertheless. Let's just jump to the application. I hope you remember. We are back in the application. We have four uh, electric bicycle sounds that we have measured binaurally. Uh, let's design our test. I already loaded the sounds. Uh, you can see that the length is okay. It's five seconds. And I have a title. I'm gonna save it again. Bicycle. There was a warning message that appeared. This warning message is there on purpose. Imagine that I designed this test completely. I run the jury on 50 people. And then the day after I decide, oh, I'm going to change something. I'm going to add an extra question. Of course, if you do that, the jury definition has changed, which means if you stop the, um, another jury testing session and invite 20 more people, it's going to be very difficult to compare the results because people from the 50 group, they answered a different type of test which is why we say, yeah, watch out when you're doing the overwriting. Okay, I'll quickly walk you through the settings. First, on the bottom left-hand side, you can choose to assign a picture to your jury test that will be shown during the session. There's either no picture, multiple, meaning you select a picture for each of the sounds, or a single picture for all the tests. We're gonna do a single picture. I hope that I have, yeah. I uh, came prepared. There is a very nice electric bicycle icon that's gonna show during our test. You can choose to show or play a prompt sound in between um, each sound that's gonna be uh, asked during the question. You can do it to gather the attention of the jurors. So you can actually record yourself saying, please listen to the next sound. And between each pair or each question, this would prompt will play. Uh, you can include a training session, meaning that before the real test happens, um, you will be able to um, play maybe two sounds to the jurors and let them answer. 
such that they can learn the UI of the application. And when the real test starts, they already can start answering without losing any time on, uh, for an example, uh, yeah, learning where to click on the button. This being said, it's not a super complicated UI, but A, it's better to spend the time and really you know, use it. So we're gonna choose bicycle D and bicycle C, which means that in the beginning, these two sounds will be used as a training. The results for the answers given to the training session will not be saved. We can impose a timeout, meaning that people have a specific time after which they can no longer answer and the test just continues. We can allow backwards navigation, meaning we can allow jurors to go back to listen to the sound again and um, answer. We can perform sound randomization, which means that every time you start a jury test, the order in which the sounds appear is going to be slightly different. And this way we take out the bias of the order in which sounds are uh, played one after the other. Uh, so each time the test is started, the, random, the order is randomized. Cool, okay. Now these are the type of tests. We talked about A-B comparison, semantic differential ranking, category judgment, chef method. Uh, for this test, I will do, let's do chef method. So see the UI for the chef method switched. I can choose if it is a button design or a slider design. I'm gonna use a button. I can choose how many buttons uh, between A and B appears. There's three, five, and seven. We are gonna choose five. How long should be the silence between the sounds? It's now one second. And how many questions appear per frame? Three. Let's design our question. Which which uh, e-bike is louder? And we don't need the answers; they are really optional, so we're not going to use them. Uh, another one: uh, which would you prefer to drive? Uh, and third one, which one sounds more robust? Okay, we have our three questions. Can be more, but remember, the more questions, the longer the test, 45 minutes, you know the drill. Finally, the last part of the application is called the jury test sequence. This allows us to design which part of the question, the test appears one after another. Um, currently, we only have a training session and the main session, so not very exciting. I already have a sequence that I had designed up front, so I will open it and then explain it to you. No modifications, thank you very much. Uh, where is my sequence? I was pretty sure I created it. Let's see here. Yes. Okay, so next to my training session and my May session, uh, my sequence now contains questions. And this is actually the biggest value in a jury test. It's about asking your jurors about their um, background, their age, their experience. For example, in here, how often do you ride a bicycle? Never, once a month, once a week, every day. I live in Belgium, we cycle every day, for an example. Um, imagine you're running a jury test and you're running it on a, like a bigger audience, not only people that you know, but really people from the street almost and they say they never ride a bicycle. How relevant are their answers if they cannot even ride a bicycle, for example? That's kind of the point why you would ask these kind of questions. Uh, what type of bicycle do you own? Can be interesting uh, if they even have an electric bicycle, a road, city, that, that, that. You can design those questions yourself. And then we just show some, um, uh, yeah, just some messages to the jurors. Uh, now, um, you can extend this list. I would typically suggest, for an example, to add uh, questions about age, uh, gender for an electric bicycle, probably not relevant. Maybe you would even not like to ask. That's really a personal thing. Um, experience with listening tests, that can be interesting. Um, any hearing loss, that can be an interesting, an interesting thing to ask. But anything that can help you qualify and quantify the results of a jury test, that's gonna help. Okay, I'm gonna save this, yep, and start my jury test execution. Now you see here, the screen is a bit more complex right now because on the right-hand side, we have a list of 
um, jurors. Uh, that's because you can run this test in a group mode, meaning people are connecting uh, via um, Wi-Fi and doing the test on their PCs, like in the video we saw in the beginning. Well, I'm alone here, so I'm going to run it in individual mode. I will not run the complete test because A, it's long, B, um, you will not be able to hear my sounds, so there is no point, but I just want to show you how it looks. The application goes into a full screen mode. I am informed about the title of the test, the type of the test, if a training session is included, and I'm prompted to give my name. There's a total duration, but it typically can be longer than what it indicates here. And we start with, yeah, how often do you ride the bicycle? I currently use it once a week. What type of bicycle do you own? I actually own a cross bicycle. And I'm informed that the training session is about to start. So you cannot hear it, but uh, the bicycle A is currently being replayed. And now bicycle B. Bicycle B is currently being replayed. And then I'm, I have my um, questions to answer. Which e-bike is louder? Definitely B. Which one would you prefer to drive? I would choose A. And which one sounds more robust? A, definitely. And you continue and on and on. Well, this is just a training session. This is for me just to learn the UI. OK. If I'm not sure, I can play again. And wait for it to play. I submit my answers and the test continues. Now the actual real session would start. I'm going to stop this. Yeah. And this is how it then works. So imagine this for 45 minutes. It's quite heavy <laughs> on the jurors, which is why we, we, we talk about these, these 45 minutes as being kind of the, the limit. And then you do the same. You can design these questions also for other types of tests, like the AB comparison or the semantic differential. Alrighty. Uh, the do's and don'ts and don'ts of conducting a listening test. Now, um, well, first the do's and how do you really do it? So typically you would run these tests in a kind of a decentralized way, because let's say um, I'm a bit biased. We are in Europe and uh, let's say the pandemic is over and we are allowed again to go back to the office. So I would conduct a listening test in my office and I would invite my colleagues to come in and do the tests. So this is my PC. I have um, uh, an RME Digiface USB audio card connected to the PC and then a headphone amplifier. I will connect a number of headphones to it. People will come with their work PCs or um, Windows tablets and they can just run a free application on their systems. And as long as we are on the same Wi-Fi network, we can conduct this test in a bigger group. The advantage is you can um, uh, kill two more birds with one stone uh, or yeah, listen in to more jurors at the same time. Uh, the disadvantage is, yeah, the setup is a bit more complex. Uh, and people can, you know, and you can swap your jurors and then do five today, then five in an hour, five in an hour. The maximum number of jurors with this particular setup and combination of hardware is 16, but, remember that people should have a kind of a quiet and comfort comfortable environment for answering those so 16 is kind of difficult to set up in a room where they don't interfere with each other but what you can also do is run these tests um, in in any location and send it to your colleague in india and your friend in the us um, and run these tests in the individual mode precisely like i just did on my opc and then send the replies or the results back to the moderator. And that's not going to have to happen on the same time. Quite the opposite. I mean, looking at the time zone differences, that would make, not really make any sense. So you just run it individually at your own PC and you send the results back to the moderator for the analysis. Um, in an individual mode, as I mentioned, yeah, you take the test individually and send back the answers and the results are analyzed automatically by the software. Uh, that's the setup. In the group mode, you sit in a room, you have a wireless connection for the test, but the hardware connection for the audio to make sure that the quality of the audio is correct. And then just you run the tests in the group mode. Uh, software demo. Well, again, I skipped my beat. You saw how I conducted the tests already. Some additional tips. 
the do's and the don'ts. Know your jurors and ask them the questions. Really make use of those statistical questions. Ask about their experience. Ask about their knowledge about the application, um, their age, perhaps. Anything that can be helpful for you to really draw a picture of what your jurors are or who they are. Um, avoid mistakes. Include the training session. It doesn't cost you that much time, but allows people to understand which button does what, even though the UI is not very difficult. Um, calibrate your jurors, same as you calibrate your microphones. Explain the issue with examples before a test starts. Have a presentation or a short video that will tell people what you are going to ask them in a second. You don't want them to start a jury test and start to figure out, wow, but what does he mean by slow modulation? What actually, what is modulation? Or what is a sporty car? If you spend the time to, to teach your people about the issue at hand, you are going to see that fade back in your results later on. Uh, the environment matters, meaning that you should assure quiet conditions for the test, especially if you're working in a group mode. Um, so not too many people at the same time, there should not be too much external noise. Um, these type of tests are often conducted with open headphones. So, you know, it's a very easy to have a very messy environment. So it's important to keep it quiet. Keep it short, a test should not should be shorter than 45 minutes. That is again, not a magical number. And at 46 minutes, all the answers turn to pumpkins. Um, it comes a bit more from experience. Uh, I myself, after 45 minutes of listening to very similar sounds, would get frustrated. And I know the quality of my answers would deteriorate as well. And I'm the product manager of this product, right? so that tells you something. Um, the sound quality matters. Check the hardware of individual jurors, especially if you're sending the, ju the jury definition to other people and they're going to conduct the test and send you the result back. Make sure that they're doing it on OK replay hardware. If you can assure that everyone has the audio card and the same headphones, that would be perfect. Is that realistic? I would hope so, but normally it is not. So making sure that at least they're not using their yeah, um, Jabra headphones for that, and even worse, on the Bluetooth connection, that's already something. If you can splurge and have everyone have a calibrated and equalized audio card and headphones, that's fantastic. That should be the goal. Um, don't waste your time and avoid correlated questions. Um, so don't ask two questions that are going to give you very similar answers. So for an example, if you ask about, does it sound pleasant? And then your second question is, uh, does it sound nice? Or for an example, does it sound pleasant? And uh, questions can correlate with each other in, in many, many ways. A best way to avoid correlated questions is to run the three juror you know, pre-study and see if there's a high Pearson correlation between the answers. If you see something like that, you can eliminate question and uh, and you know don't spend time on it. Um, if you can, if it's possible, offering your jurors an incentive for coming in to do the test can really really help. It will really improve their focus a lot. Um, I know that it's not always possible. Uh, in academic or research type of environment, sometimes it's possible to, to pay people something, but unfortunately that's not always the case, especially if we do it for work. I, I'm sure my boss would not be happy if I asked for money to pay people to do a jury test, but maybe a candy, a sandwich lunch, you know, something to say thank you for spending the time and listening to my, uh, you know, artificially modulated tones for the last 45 minutes can definitely help to sweeten the deal a little bit. So. Um, pictures matter, uh, meaning that having a picture in your jury test can really help. And as you saw, I, I saw the, like, the icon of an electric bicycle. That's not gonna help that much, it just looks a bit nicer. But often using a picture that correlates well with the environment in which people are judging. So if you're doing a vacuum cleaner, um, sound jury test, you may want to add a picture of a dirty room. Um, 
to kind of like mentally hook the people to the environment in which they are conducting this. But by all means, even though we give this as an option, avoid assigning pictures per sound. There is a very fun paper, I think it um, dates back to the 90s, where on purpose um, um, a study group conducted jury tests in group one and then in group two. In group one, um, they assigned a red, a picture of a red car to sound one. In group two, they assigned the picture of a red car to sound to the another sound. And in both cases, sound two was the most sporty. Um, uh, sorry, in both cases, the red car was the most sporty, simply because people have an association that red cars are faster. And as I drive a red car, I know that this is very true. Uh, but still, um, take out the bias of the picture and make people focus on the sound by really um, making them look either at a single picture or no picture whatsoever. Otherwise, you may see the effect of the picture playing in, in their answers. It will also allow them to recognize the sound that comes back if they see again the same picture, um, which will again kind of lead their answers a little bit. So even though the option exists in the software, unless you have a very specific reason to use pictures, I would avoid it. Um, speak the language of the jurors, use terminology that they are familiar with. If you're using terminology that they don't are not familiar with, for an example, the word modulation is not really that common for people outside of the yeah, sound, NVH, sound quality type of world. Explain it before. Just make sure that, um, uh, that they can understand your questions well. And one final tip that is not in this slide, but we already discussed it before. Um, remember when we talked about A-B comparison, uh, if you give them the, if you give your jurors the option for the to go for the middle, so the middle button with equal, or like if you give them sporty, not sporty, and five buttons in between, that middle button, that middle option, it's kind of a safe zone. People are drawn to it. They really like yeah, middle. It's easy. It's lazy. It's not going to help you that much. So if you can avoid the middle option, avoid it. And, and 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 force them to make a decision. It's only going to be beneficial for you. Alrighty, uh, finally, uh, timing-wise, okay. Analyzing the test data. I will not um, perform an analysis of the bicycle test because the jury study that we're running on those is actually not complete. So what I'm going to load is instead a test that we performed last year. That is normal. And that is the test um, on actually the four um, Tesla sounds. One of them is the region original, and the full uh, the, the three additional ones is Tesla with a sound design option with Avas. Um, let's perform the analysis. Uh, the question was simply about preference, and there was an A-B comparison. So sound A, sound B, choose the one you prefer most. And here is an analysis screen. So I'll walk you through this, what you see here. Uh, this is just the preference. We have the four sounds and how often they were chosen against each other. Uh, here on the top of the screen on the right, you see the uh, statistical distribution on the answers that people gave to your questions. In our case, we asked about age. What type of vehicle do you drive? Combustion, hybrid, electric. What is your gender? Um, yeah, Siemens um, is an engineering company, which means our distribution was really I would say still okay. And the first question was, yeah, just the age and the different categories. Now, what you see on the left-hand side is actually the single jurors. You can go over here and you will see the names, Evelyn, Tom, um, here is Dirk. And additionally, you see them plotted on a graph that shows consistency and concordance. And these are two metrics that allow you to judge the quality of the answer that people gave you. Because for an example, consistency, meaning how consistent the answers of your jurors are. And we have two people, Evelyn and Tom, who have a consistency lower than 0.6, which means, um, yeah, over 50, uh, yeah, like 40, over 40% 40 of their answers were not consistent, which, I mean, that's a lot uh, if you look at the rest. So what we can do is we can assign, um, 
filters, which says the consistency should be greater than 0.6. Voila, apply. What should happen is that all the jurors should move to the top right quadrant, meaning the jurors give high quality answers and concordance is high, concordance being the metric that tells you how much people are in agreement with each other. We additionally should see an improvement in the differences between the results because we're uh, removing the inconsistent people. So let's apply. Voila. We see an improvement in the differences. The differences between the samples are higher and many of the jurors move to the top right hand side. We see one more person, Dirk. It seems like Dirk is not agreeing with the rest of the jurors. His concordance is very low. It's like 0.3 which means Dirk has a completely different opinion than everyone else in the room, which is not bad, but it can mean that maybe we are not really interested in his opinion at the moment because he doesn't agree with the majority. So we're gonna set the concordance filter, apply, voila, the differences improve further. We have the top right quadrant, seems like we're good. Um, and that would be a result that I would then export to Excel and start further analysis. Um, shortly on the tests, that's the overview that I already showed you. Um, consistency, that's something that's, that I still wanted to explain. Um, consistency, you can test in two ways. First one is the circular or triad consistency. And that is, if sound one is better than sound two, that's what the juror said. And then he said, sound two is better than sound three. So it's logical to assume that sound one should also be better than sound three. But if that's not the case in his answers, then he is not consistent. His circular or triad consistency, it's a difficult word for me to pronounce, is poor. So he the, the score for the consistency would drop. Then the easy one, replication consistency. If we first ask about sound one versus sound two, and later on ask about sound two versus sound one, and the answer is not the same, the consistency drops again. And the cool thing about the jury testing application is those two things are checked automatically for you, uh, for your jurors. And then the concordance, that's what I mentioned before. If I ask everyone here in the room, what is your favorite color? And everyone would say blue, but Charles would say that is green. It doesn't mean that Charles is wrong. It just means that he's not concordant to the group. And while we um, respect his difference in opinion, we are going to kindly remove him from the jury test because he, you know, his his answers are not going to help us with our analysis. So aiming for high consistency and concordance is a good way to improve your jury test results. And finally, um, why would you do a jury test? Why would you even conduct these type of listening tests? Well, um, if you want to perform some kind of target setting, you're using, you, you want to know like what is the acceptable modulation level in my sound or what is the acceptable sound pressure level. Um, you can run a jury test which has sounds with, in this case, similar modulation frequency but different modulation uh, depth, 20, 30, 40, 50%. And the jury test can tell you, okay, it seems like people are starting to accept the sounds if the modulation is at 30 percent anything lower they don't accept it so you can have a result and your input for target setting the second use case is simple benchmarking uh, which competitive product is considered best sounding and why you have a product from competitive a with these sound quality results competitive b with these sound quality results people chose b and i by doing a sound quality analysis we find out that a prominence ratio, which is seven decibels lower than the competitor, was the deciding reason, and at a higher frequency, was the deciding reason why this product sounds better in the eyes and the ears of the jurors. Finally, objectify impression. Uh, if we need to design a product that sounds robust, but we don't know what robust means, um, it can be simply a combination of existing psychoacoustic metrics which together by means of some kind of regression analysis would tell us, okay, robustness is in fact 0.5 times loudness minus 0.4 times modulation, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's what jury testing can give you if you correlate it with some quality analysis by means of, in this case, for an example, um, for an example, linear regression, but there are other ways to do it as well. Voila, 
I am almost on time, one minute over. Um, we have one question. Will it be valid to equalize headset data for loudness? Um, absolutely, yes. Uh, does it mean that the sounds are still equalized? Of course, no, because you have modified them. However, um, if you need sounds that um, are loudness equalized for the purpose of your jury test, that is absolutely still valid. Just don't use it for benchmarking purposes. Simply use them if you're really trying to focus on other aspects of the sounds. Well, la I don't see more questions in the question box. I can check the chat as well, but I have not seen that much. Ne, seems like we're out of questions, unless there's anything else that you would like to ask, and then go ahead. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending. Uh, uh, we will share the slides with you, and then any questions, I guess, can be addressed to Charles. Great job, Aneska. So much information you packed into that hour for us. Really appreciate it. We don't mind you going over. We enjoyed the presentation. And we are out of time, and it does look like we're out of questions as well. You did such a great job. I don't think anyone has any, but you see your email there, so please feel free to email Aneska or myself, and we'd be happy to follow up on any questions you have on this topic. And as I said earlier, I'll send out a follow-up email, which will contain a link to the recording of this webinar and also all the great slides that Aneska shared today as well. Well, since we're out of time, I'll just say uh, hope you have a great day and hope to see you in another webinar in the future. Thank you so much, Aneska. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.